So it's really my great pleasure to introduce today's colloquium speaker, Professor Kun Yang from Florida State University. Um, Professor Yang is one of the most preeminent, uh, preeminent experts on pretty much everything in strongly correlated quantum matter and more broadly speaking, works on a lot of different topics such as superconductivity, superfluidity, magnetism, on the whole, uh, graphene, et cetera, et cetera. And he's also one of the few people I know that uh, can connect these topics at the heart of condensed matter physics to other interesting fields of physics. Basically, whenever I have a physics question, he will be the first person that I ask. You don't necessarily get the answer though, but <laughs> <laughs> I will try first. Um, so with people of his stature, you don't in such introductions always go back to the PhD work. But I want to mention his PhD advisor, Steve Gervin, because together with him, he just co-authored uh, what may be the book on condensed matter to replace the gold standard by Ashcroft and Berman that I'm sure many of you are familiar with and that you know for decades has seemed just as dated as irreplaceable. <laughs> but that may just have happened. So this, uh, the Young and Gerben is I think uh, only three years out now, but I know many people who already consider it the legitimate um, successor to the intergenerational golden standard that Ashcroft and Merman has been. So, um, of course, his work has also, apart from that, earned him a lot of awards and recognition. He has been a Sloan Fellow. He has been an APS Fellow for many, many years. Um, he's had prestigious postdoctoral affiliations with Princeton, Caltech, and he has been on the faculty of FSU, I think since 1999 or something. Um, so uh, where, and this is probably one of his lesser contributions to science, he's also been my postdoctoral advisor. <laughs> but in short, he's one of the most um, authoritative people to give a talk on such a thing as quantum hall and how it possibly relates to gravity. And so uh, I'm very looking forward to uh, learning about that. Well, thank you so much, Alex, for such a generous uh, uh, and very nice uh, introduction. So, uh, well, working at the MagLab, uh, one of the, 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 the advantages is that we have a, a, a a steady stream of a very distinguished postdocs. Alex, of course, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a representative of them. Um, so uh, since Alex came here, I have actually been a frequent visitor. So we just counted that this is probably my- uh, I have oh. many questions. Yeah, well, me too, as a matter of fact. <laughs> anyway, so we're still collaborating, as a matter of fact. So this, this uh, we just counted, uh, is, is my fourth visit. Uh, since uh, uh, Alex came here as a as a as a professor, I think uh, uh, in uh, 2008, and uh, my last visit was probably some five years ago, and uh, I gave a, uh, a gave a seminar, not not a colloquium. Anyway, so so this is a colloquium. I will try to make it uh, uh, general and broad, and uh, therefore start with uh, with the very basics. So so the title uh, of the talk does include a few buzzwords. Uh, but let's start from the very beginning of the Hall effect. Okay, so this is a this is a talk on quantum Hall physics. But but let's start with the, with the classical maybe in quotation mark uh, uh, Hall effect. So this is something that we probably learned all the way back in, in middle school, if not if not earlier. We learned that uh, because of the magnetic field, uh, the motion of the charge uh, gives rise to the uh, uh, to the Lorentz force, which has to be balanced by a, a Hall field of whole voltage, uh, which is actually in the perpendicular direction uh, of the both the magnetic field and the current. And the uh, back of the envelope calculation uh, tells you that the whole uh, resistance 
um, uh, which is the ratio between the whole field and the whole current, uh, is actually independent of a lot of the uh, details like the scattering rate and all that, but depends very sensitively on the density of the carriers. So it is very experimentally a very useful way to measure the carrier density. Now, uh, one aspect which is perhaps not always emphasized is that it's actually also very sensitive to the sign of the charge. Now, naively we think that uh, the, the current comes from the motion of the electron, which of course has negative charge. But sometimes you actually measure a positive Hall coefficient or Hall resistance. To actually understand that you do need quantum mechanics, it's actually a combination of the band theory and the uh, 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 fermionic nature of the, uh, uh, of, of the charge carrier, which is the electron in this case, that allows for the uh, um, possibility of a positive or whole-like Hall effect. So this already involves quantum mechanics, but that's of course not yet the uh, quantum Hall effect. So the quantum Hall effect uh, is actually uh, illustrated uh, 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 on this plot. So when you have a very high uh, quality two-dimensional electron gas, uh, when you go to very low temperature and look at the dependence of the whole uh, resistance and the longitudinal resistance uh, as a function of magnetic field, well, at low field, you see this classical behavior, namely this uh, linear uh, 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 field dependence. But as you go to higher field, you see a sequence of plateaus, okay, uh, labeled by either integer or uh, 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 a rational fraction. When you are on uh, one of these plateaus, the longitudinal resistance actually goes to zero, meaning that the current actually has no dissipation. While classically, because the effect of the, of the field has been canceled, uh, if the effect of the magnetic field has been canceled by the, by the, uh, 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 the whole voltage, uh, you would expect the longitudinal resistance in, independent of magnetic field. Uh, that is not the case uh, at high field uh, either. So um, the, uh, depending on these numbers, which actually is, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, appears in the denominator of the whole resistance in units of the uh, uh, quantum resistance H of E squared, uh, it can be either integer or fractional. Uh, you actually separate these plateaus into um, uh, integer and uh, fractional quantum Hall effects. Uh, respectively. So um, in addition to the fascinating physics, th this plot is very unusual in that a single plot actually uh, actually uh, represents two separate Nobel Prizes uh, for the integer and fractional effects separately. So uh, the integer effect was first discovered by von Christian in 1980 and only five years later the Nobel Prize was actually awarded to him. Uh, the fractional effect was actually discovered, but, but not in this material, which is gallium arsenide, but in, uh, well, sorry. The integer effect was actually uh, first discovered in the different materials, but the fractional effect was actually first discovered in this gallium arsenide system, uh, was, uh, was discovered two years later, but it took, uh, uh, I guess, a bit longer for the Nobel Committee to actually award its importance. And it did happen in 1998, sorry, 1998, and uh, the quotation did not uh, explicitly use the term fractional quantum Hall effect, but instead emphasizes the discovery of a new form of quantum liquid with fractionally charged excitation. I will comment a little bit more on that uh, uh, later on. So these, of course, two separate Nobel Prizes uh, awarded specifically to the discovery of both fractional and integer quantum Hall effect, but there are at least two additional Nobel Prizes that are at least related to uh, 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 quantum Hall effect. Uh, one of them is the 2010 Nobel Prize for graphene. Uh, the reason, of course, graphene is so important and so interesting is because uh, it hosts Dirac uh, uh, electrons or Dirac particles in condensed matter systems. But what convinced the community that we did have uh, Dirac fermions in graphene is actually this so-called unusual of half integer quantized integer quantum Hall effect sequence. So here, for reasons that I don't want to spend too much time uh, discussing, uh, the appropriate uh, unit for uh, Hall conductance or Hall resistance is 4 e square of H. This factor of 4 has, uh, uh, has to do with the twofold spin degeneracy and twofold uh, valley degeneracy. But in this proper units, you find that the integer sequence is actually not at integer, but actually at half integer, one half, three halves, et cetera, et cetera. And this half shift is related to the pi barrier phase 
associated with the direct points. So when you actually move in momentum space uh, around a circle that, in, uh, that encloses the direct point, there is a very phase uh, which is unique to uh, massless direct fermions. So this is a, a yet another uh, quantum hole related uh, 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 Nobel Prize. Uh, the one that's actually perhaps most directly relevant to the title of the talk is of course the 2016 Nobel Prize, which actually recognizes contributions uh, uh, to condensed matter physics from the, uh, from the perspective of topology. So uh, 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 in particular, the, uh, uh, the contribution uh, 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 due to Salas actually recognizes the relevance of topology to the quantum Hall effect by actually identifying uh, the whole conductance as a topological quantum number or topological invariant. And that is of course the origin of the quantization or if you wish universality uh, of the, uh, of the uh, value of the whole conductance on these plateaus. So this is a picture I actually copied from the, uh, the Nobel site. Basically uh, the simplest way to actually, uh, 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 simplest example if you wish, uh, uh, of topology is uh, if you have happen to be a bakery, uh, depending on whether you just want to bake a regular bread or a donut or some kind of pretzel, the number of holes uh, is, uh, is a topological invariant uh, because when you actually change the shape of these objects, the number of holes actually do not change unless of course you encounter some kind of uh, singularity. And the, uh, not, uh, the value of the whole conductance on these plateaus uh, in a way is like uh, uh, the number of holes uh, uh, in actually a very complicated uh, space for wave function, not of course a space uh, of, 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 of your bakery. Anyway, so, um, so the, uh, 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 it's fair to say that um, quantum Hall effects gave birth to the notion of topological phase and topological order, which are now concepts that are extremely popular and widely used uh, in all uh, branches of physics, okay? So this, if you wish, um, is, uh, is a short summary of, of, the, of the term uh, topology uh, 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 in, in my title. Now, uh, uh, but this is actually not the aspect of quantum Hall physics uh, that I would like to emphasize in this talk. So I'm in some sense going in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a perpendicular direction. So um, even though most people think about quantum Hall physics from the uh, topolo topological perspective, uh, turns out, as I'm trying to actually convince you, there is actually very interesting non-universal or non-quantized physics in fractional quantum Hall liquids. And some of these non-universal physics is associated with geometry, not just a, a topology. So this is a point that was first, uh, to me, emphasized uh, by Duncan Haldane in a very important paper published almost exactly 10 years ago. So, so, so to, to a large extent, uh, 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 all what I'm going to talk about um, for the rest of the talk uh, is in some sense, uh, 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 in some sense grow out of uh, that, that in very deep insight. So the first specific uh, 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 message I'm, I'm going to actually convey or a specific result I'm going to report is that actually this geometry or the geometric uh, uh, degree of freedom of fractional quantum Hall liquids is not just a uh, theoretical construct but it actually is, uh, is actually something that can be directly measured experimentally. In fact, uh, uh, it has been uh, directly measured and the theory has been, has advanced to such a point that we can actually make direct and uh, quantitative comparison between uh, theory and experiment. Um, this uh, geometrical degree of freedom not only exists, it actually also has highly non-trivial quantum dynamics. And it has been argued that uh, the dynamics of uh, this uh, uh, neutral uh, geometric degree of freedom gives rise to a very exotic spin two uh, 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 quantum particle excitation, which is named uh, gravitons by Haldane and Song and, uh, 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 and uh, their collaborators. So the, the second specific result I'm going to report is that there is actually a way to excite these gravitons and probe uh, <laughs> its, its spectrum using uh, a condensed matter analog of gravitational waves, which actually is uh, acoustic waves. And I'm going to explain um, uh, why an acoustic wave uh, behaves as if it's like uh, it's a gravitational wave. 
So the last set of results, uh, 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 which are also the most re recent, are uh, to me the most exciting ones. So far, we are talking about uh, geometrical excitations in quantum Hall liquids whose topological properties are well understood. But now we are going to apply these ideas or these results to uh, 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 a particular uh, quantum Hall state, this five half state, whose nature is actually still under debate, okay? Uh, turns out, as we're going to see, these gravitons are chiral, okay? And this, this chirality can also be measured. And most importantly, when you try to probe the chirality of this, these gravitons, it can actually tell you, or at least distinguish between different competing topological orders at this five half state. And therefore, in turn, the, uh, uh, by studying these geometrical excitations, you can actually learn something about the topological order. So we go all the way back to topology uh, at this very end. Okay, so uh, since this is a, 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 a colloquium, I'll at least try to give a very uh, crude, if you wish, character of the uh, integer and quantum Hall plateaus and uh, their topological nature. So um, one sort of hand-waving way to understand this integer quantum Hall effect is just to use uh, non-interacting electrons and perhaps not even the fully quantum mechanical description of non-interacting electrons, but actually use some kind of semi-classical description. So we all know classically, the electrons would actually be doing their cyclotron motion uh, when it is actually confined to a two-dimensional space like this, uh, uh, this, uh, this sheet uh, and subject to a magnetic field. So quantum mechanics actually uh, gives rise to two effects. One is the quantization of the orbital of the, uh, uh, the, the size of the cyclotron orbit. Basically, uh, the uh, area of this orbit has to enclose uh, integer number of flux quanta and the lowest lambda level, which is the most important uh, uh, arena, if you wish, for electrons to, to, to be in, uh, to exhibit quantum Hall physics, is the lowest lambda level. So that should enclose a one flux quanta. And the other, of course, is, uh, is uh, 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 the Pauli principle because uh, electrons are fermions, so therefore every electron has to stay within its own orbit and not uh, the neighbor's orbit. So uh, one way to actually, uh, let me actually see. So yeah, so, so since I already showed uh, uh, this, this plot uh, is to actually imagine that the electrons are some dancers. So they have some quantized dancing pattern and the dancing pattern is such that uh, they are all doing their own dance, not correlated with each other, and subject to this uh, uh, geometric, well, this area conserving uh, quantization rule and this Pauli principle that they uh, cannot uh, step on, uh, uh, step into uh, 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 her neighbor's uh, territory. So this already actually uh, can very roughly at least explain the quantized uh, transport phenomena that we uh, just saw. So. Naively, we think because everybody is just doing these cyclotron circle motions, uh, they are not going anywhere. So they're, therefore, uh, they, are, they are actually like uh, uh, electrons in an insulator, which is actually not able to conduct current. But that's actually not quite true. Because now if you consider electrons at the edge, you find that before they can actually uh, complete one circle, it actually bounces into the uh, edge of the, uh, of the sample. So then it bounces back and it tries to actually complete another circle, again, unable to uh, uh, complete. But during this bouncing motion, you find that on the right edge, the electrons are moving downward. And similarly, for the uh, electrons on the left edge, it's actually through these uh, skipping uh, orbits moving upward. So the electrons near the edges can actually conduct current because they are able to actually move either uh, from down to up or from up to down. So actually the quantized and dissipationless whole current are carried by these, uh, by these edge currents. So why are they quantized? Because the, 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 the number of conduction channels is actually controlled by the number of the lambda levels. Or if you wish, the current carrying ability of these edge electrons is actually uh, determined by the, uh, by, the, uh, 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 by the quantized motion of these uh, uh, electrons. And the reason that they're dissipationless is because to give rise to dissipation, to have dissipation, you have to have backscattering. But because the upward motion and downward motion uh, of the electrons are separated in space, 
there's actually no way to backscatter. So that actually explains the dissipationless nature of the quantum uh, whole uh, transport. So, uh, well, so, so this of course is, is, is very simple, but what about the uh, fractional quantum Hall effect? So here you can actually understand that uh, by invoking a different dancing pattern. So for fractional quantum Hall liquids, the density of electrons is actually lower. So one third, for example, means the ratio between the number of electrons and number of first quantum is one to three, unlike the nuclear one integer quantum Hall states one to one. So here, because you have more room, then the electrons can actually dance around uh, more freely. So they can really move around like in the liquid, unlike here, it's essentially like a solid. But there, the rule of the game is a little bit different. Not just the Pauli principle, but here you also want to actually make sure that the electrons stay away from each other. And that is of course, because they have the cooling repulsion. So more specifically, the one third Laughlin uh, dancing pattern requires that when you're approaching an existing dancer, you have to dance around it in three steps. Or if you wish, you have to actually dance around in a circle that encloses exactly three plus quantum. So this actually already allows you to explain the type of quality particles that carries fractional charge. So let's assume that we have a pillar in this dancing floor. Now obviously, you don't want to uh, uh, dance into this pillar. So what happens to the dancer when you actually approach this pillar? Well, you have to use this quantized step to dance around it. So therefore some electrons are depleted from this pillar, which uh, is, if you wish, a, a topological, um, topological defect in this dancing pattern. Well, so this is very much like what happens uh, 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 to an existing electron because other electrons would like to stay away from an, uh, an existing electron as well. So let's actually measure how much charge gets depleted near this pillar or this defect compared to that of the electron. So here you have to actually uh, dance around it in three steps or you have to dance around a circle in, uh, in three first quanta. Here, uh, the, the, the one step dancing for single electron encloses one first quanta. So you find that by just comparing these two pictures, you find that the charge carried by this, uh, by this defect uh, is one third of that of the electron. So this gives you a cartoon picture of why you can have actually one third uh, charged uh, quality particles uh, in Laughlin liquid. And that of course is the reason that um, is quoted by the Nobel uh, Committee for the uh, freshman quantum hall uh, uh, Nobel Prize in 1998. Okay, so just to summarize, well, okay, so here's, here's the book that, uh, that uh, Alex mentioned. So here's another representation of the uh, laughing dancing pattern. So here, uh, it's actually emphasizing a slightly uh, different aspect of it. So the three arrows uh, uh, associated with each ball, which actually rep represents the electron, represents the three flux quanta. So uh, uh, there are actually different ways to actually interpret this picture. But in, in some sense to preparing uh, 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 myself a little bit for some things that I will talk about later in the talk, uh, let's actually view this as the electron sucking the three flux quanta associated with it into itself and form a composite object, let me call that a composite boson. So the reason the composite uh, uh, subject, uh, object is actually a boson is that even though the electron itself is actually fermionic, the three flux, uh, 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 gives rise to an off bomb effect that actually gives you additional minus sign when the two electrons, two particles, uh, um, uh, 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 exchange with each other and turn that into a uh, uh, boson or composite boson. So the composite boson being a bosonic object can now both condense. And uh, for reasons that I won't have time to explain in detail, the both condensation of these composite bosons can be a way efficient way actually to, uh, to, to understand the, uh, uh, the fractional quantum Hall effect. So, um, so as, uh, as Alex mentioned, the book was uh, uh, published three years ago now. Uh, uh, and since then it has been uh, adopted by quite a few places. This is a very, uh, this is a very uh, 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 in, uh, incomplete list and Zohar here uh, was uh, among the very first to actually adopt it here. So, uh, so yes, it was our goal uh, to, to actually uh, replace actual worming, and I don't know if, if, if it will ever uh, succeed. But, but I did learn from Una King relatively recently that 
uh, 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 she and also uh, uh, Delaf uh, uh, adopted it at Cornell with apparently no resistance. So, so that I suppose is a is a good sign. So it's just a, a case for for you younger people uh, who didn't know uh, Ashraf Mermin. Uh, wrote wrote uh, their book uh, when they were both assistant, assistant professors <laughs> at Cornell, which is something that I would never recommend. <laughs> as a matter of fact, <laughs> anyway. So so that's uh, I don't know. A, yeah, fifteen second uh, commercial break. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. So so coming back to dancing patterns. So so we talked about the individual trivial dancing pattern, and the much more interesting laughing dancing pattern, which we use to. Uh, to, uh, 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 to, to represent this uh, Laughlin uh, topological order. And we have more exotic and even more interesting dancing patterns. So one of which is what I would call the more real dancing pattern, which will be very relevant to what I'm going to talk about at the very end. So in this dancing pattern, it allows two dancers to get us as close as party principle would actually allow you. But the rule is that once this pair is nearby and doing their intimate things, everyone else should stay away, which I think is a, is, is a very good rule, both for physics and for, for social behavior. And more specifically, all the other dancers will have to uh, stay uh, uh, four steps away, okay? So, uh, so what's good about this dancing pattern is that it not only gives rise to fractionally charged quasi particles, these quasi particles are turned out to be non abelian and uh, uh, have uh, potential applications for topological uh, quantum computation. So, what about geometry, uh, which is the other keyword uh, in the title of my talk, which actually is the, is the one that I would like to emphasize? Well, as uh, Haldem pointed out, although not in these words, well, this rule that you have to actually dance around another. Dancer, I'm coming back to laughing now, uh, in three steps, meaning that whatever this loop is has to enclose three flux quanta. There's nothing dictates that it has to be a, uh, has to be a, 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 a full circle. It could be, for example, distorted to an ellipse, as long as the area does not change, okay? So why would you want to do that? Well, there could be various energetic reasons to do that. For example, uh, uh, for if let's say your cooling interaction in the presence of an anisotropic material with anisotropic um, dielectric function uh, is stronger, let's say along uh, this direction than that direction, then you would like to stay away from each other in this direction at the expense that you may get a little bit closer in the other direction. Another possibility, uh, particularly relevant to what I'm going to talk about is that perhaps you have an anisotropic effective mass and the cyclotron orbit is naturally an isotropic to begin with. And that may have an effect on the many body state and resulting in a, a dancing pattern that is actually distorted. So, um, so the term that Haldane used is uh, something called area pr uh, preserving diffeomorphism, uh, saying that, well, uh, the correlation hole uh, in, let's say, the Laughlin liquid. Uh, can change its shape, but cannot uh, change uh, the uh, topology dictated uh, total area. So one immediate consequence of this observation is that unlike uh, what you have been told, that roughly low down a very, very unusual variational wave function that has no variational parameter, there is actually a hidden variational parameter uh, in the in actually not just the, 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 the original Laughlin wave function, but actually a whole sequence of Laughlin states that are parameterized by this geometrical, um, geometrical uh, parameter. So, um, so, so, so we actually uh, shortly after uh, uh, constructed uh, this uh, uh, family of uh, Laughlin states. The original Laughlin wave function, which is isotropic, has this uh, circular, um, Correlation hole, but if you change the uh, geometrical parameter a little bit, let's say from zero to one half to introduce some anisotropy, then you find that the correlation hole gets distorted, which is uh, elongated in this case along the, along the y direction. So yeah, so 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 these uh, uh, family of Laughlin states uh, uh, do exist and uh, can be actually written down explicitly. 
But the problem is, how do you actually probe uh, this, this geometry or this shape? Or how do you actually tell the difference, let's say, between this laughing state and that laughing state? Well, obviously, it's not visible here because no matter which one is realized in your sample, they have the same topology, okay? And the universal properties, like the quantized value of the whole uh, conductance of resistance is only a reflection of this topology. So therefore it cannot distinguish between uh, these two states that I just uh, uh, illustrated. So in some sense, uh, the topology actually sucks. It actually gets in the way to reveal this uh, richer physics that actually goes beyond topology. So what do we do? Well, one third is of course not the only quantum Hall state. There's a whole sequence that's shown here, two fifths, seven thirds, nine, uh, four ninths, et cetera. From this side, there's a whole other sequence starting from two thirds. And there are, there's a corresponding sequence, which actually um, ends at this uh, a one half filling factor, which is right in the middle, which is actually not the quantum Hall state. So, um, well, uh, 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 I suppose some of you uh, uh, have heard uh, talks about that particular state, which I will actually have a, a few things to say about uh, a little bit later, very soon, as a matter of fact. Uh, this state is actually very, very important because in a way it can be viewed as a parent of all of these uh, so-called gene sequence states. So, so therefore, if these quantum Hall states have this geometrical degree of freedom, then so should this uh, parent state. So the idea that I'm going to actually get to now is how about actually try to probe uh, the geometry of this state, and perhaps that will also tell you uh, something, uh, tell you something about the geometry of these states. And I'm going to demonstrate that that's indeed possible. So let's now say a few words about uh, this state. So the difference between the one half state and the one third state is that the ratio between number of electrons and number of first quantum is one to two instead of one to three. So how do we actually understand the one to two ratio? Well, one way to understand it is to, again, assume that the electron is able to suck the flux uh, onto, onto, onto them and form another composite uh, object with one electron and two flux quantum. So in this case, if you redo the arithmetics that I uh, alluded to, you find that, well, the electron has uh, this minus one exchange statistics uh, phase, but the two plus quanta gives rise to plus one instead of minus one. So the change from three to two is a change from odd to even, and therefore minus one to plus one. So therefore this composite object would still be a fermion, and that's known as composite fermion. Okay, so this is a, a, a very interesting uh, 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 object. People have done a lot of study, so one of the uh, questions that uh, Menzo Shagan's experimental group at Princeton asked is the following. So let's assume at zero magnetic field before we actually give any uh, flux to the electrons to suck in, uh, we have an isotropic band structure giving rise to a isotropic Fermi surface. Well then by symmetry, we would expect the composite fermions will also have an isotropic Fermi surface. And that turned out to be true. People have actually done various kinds of experiments to probe this Fermi surface, measured KF, et cetera, et cetera. And everything worked out uh, what you would expect. But the question that this group asks is, what if I start with an anisotropic material such that at zero magnetic field, the electrons have an anisotropic Fermi surface to begin with? Then what happens to these composite fermions once I turn on magnetic field to put them in half filling? So since this is a colloquium, um, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, 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 discussing the experimental details other than saying that they are we very well developed and very reliable. I will only mention that uh, experimentally you have uh, more than one actually uh, knob to actually control this uh, uh, electron and isotropy, one is to apply an in-plane magnetic field, which in addition to the Zeeman effect also has an orbital coupling due to the finite uh, well thickness. The other is to actually uh, apply a string. Basically the string distorts the lattice and of course introduces an isotropy. 
So, so these both actually affect the effective mass tensor, which is a rank two tensor. And for reasons that will become very clear soon, I write that in the form of a metric tensor, which is also rank two tensor, okay? So experimentally, you have ways to actually control this metric tensor, which is really just the inverse effect mass tensor. So what did they find? Well, not surprisingly, they find that a anisotropic electron Fermi surface will also give you give rise to an anisotropic composite fermion Fermi surface, of course, because you have broken the symmetry. But somewhat surprisingly, and perhaps very surprisingly in the beginning, they found that the composite fermion uh, Fermi surface always has less anisotropy, actually often much less anisotropy. So that is a little bit different from the most naive theory you can come up with, which is a mean field theory, which is, okay, well, nothing happens when you suck the, uh, suck the flux, and therefore the composite fermion will have exactly the same effective mass as the, uh, uh, as the electron, and therefore they should have exactly the same anisotropy. And people did make theory, theoretical predictions of that, but that's not, uh, uh, that's not uh, experimentally found. So uh, the first uh, claim I'm going to make is that, first of all, this Fermi surface geometry is a direct reflection of Haldane's geometry. So that may sound a little surprising because I have been talking about geometry in real space, but here I'm talking about geometry in momentum space. How can it be that these two are actually related or even the same thing? Well, it turns out in the magnetic field, there is actually a duality relation between real space and momentum space. The easiest way to understand that is to redo your quantum mechanics exercise, which is to solve the Landau problem in the Landau gauge. In the Landau gauge, the momentum, let's say, along the y direction is a good quantum number. But you find that the momentum along the y direction actually tells you where the electron wave function is located along the x direction. So basically, the y momentum is due to the x position and the x momentum is due to the y why uh, 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 momentum. So therefore, basically the momentum space is a 90 degree rotated version of the real space. Okay. And also with this claim, which I'm going to justify uh, 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 in the next slide, gives us a new way to understand what is area preserving diffeomorphism. Well, in momentum space, we have this uh, celebrated Luttinger theorem, which tells you that the Fermi surface can change its shape, but not change its, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, its volume. Well, which of course in 2D volume is just area. So the, 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 the area preserving diffeomorphism is nothing but uh, the duality, if you wish, or the dual version of the uh, Luttinger theorem in momentum space. Okay, so that's the claim. And now I, I need to actually demonstrate or justify these uh, statements. And of course, again, this is, uh, this is uh, for half filling, but uh, with this justification, I'm going to also make connection with the, all the filling factors, in, including, of course, Laughlin and other, um, other uh, 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 fractional fillings. So these can all be demonstrated through an exactly soluble model. So the nice thing about quantum Hall physics is that we always assume, at least theoretically, <coughs> excuse me, while in the high field limit or actually uh, equivalently a zero mass limit such that the lambda level spacing goes to infinity. And that, of course, automatically confines the motion of electrons to a particular given lambda level, usually, but not always the lowest lambda level. So there, of course, there's no kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is quantized to a constant. So the only thing you need to worry about is the two-body interaction. Usually, well, physically, that's a coolant interaction, but theoretically, we can consider all kinds of interactions. So if you are taking quantum mechanics, you know, of course, quantum mechanics is hard because you have to deal with non-commuting operators and of course the kinetic energy and the potential energy don't commute and that's what makes it hard. Well, if the professor gives you a problem where the Hamiltonian only has the, 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 the potential term, then you will say, aha, that should be the easiest quantum mechanics problem that uh, I, I can solve, but not quite. Why? Because you have to put in upfront the lambda level constraint. So when you put in the lambda level constraint, what you have to do is to replace 
these coordinates, electron coordinates, by the so-called guiding center coordinates. And these guiding center coordinates being the projected version of the position operators no longer commute with each other. So the non-commutativity is still there. So it's still a very, very hard problem. And at the lambda level information is encoded in the so-called lambda level form factor. So for the lowest lambda level, the form factor is a Gaussian, basically reflecting the fact that the lambda level wave functions are harmonic oscillator wave functions, the lowest lambda level wave functions are just the Gaussian wave functions. And most importantly for this discussion, the anisotropy of the effective mass is reflected in the anisotropy in the lambda level form factor, okay? But so far I haven't specified the two-body interaction yet. Well, the special soluble model that I considered has a Gaussian interaction. The nice thing about Gaussian is that a Gaussian in real space, once you fully transform it to the momentum space, which is where I formulated the problem, is also a Gaussian. And more specifically, I consider an isotropic Gaussian interaction. So here I have an isotropic Gaussian, which is combined with an anisotropic Gaussian, which results in yet another Gaussian, which has less anisotropy because the mixture between something that's isotropic and something that's anisotropic. And of course you can read out the anisotropy very easily and somewhere between completely isotropic, which is one and something that uh, is associated with the electron, uh, uh, the effect of mass. So therefore you can immediately read out the anisotropy of the solution of this homotony because it can be mapped into, uh, into the isotropic problem by simple rescaling. And the nice thing about this model is that I haven't even told you what the filling factor is. If I apply this result to half filling where I expect a composite fermion Fermi C state, I can immediately read out the anisotropy of the Fermi surface. But if I apply this to the one third filling where I expect a laughing uh, uh, fractional quantum Hall state, that should be the anisotropy of the laughing state. So uh, for the, uh, um, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, half field problem, people can do numerical calculations to, uh, to, to actually directly measure the, uh, 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 directly measure the Fermi surface anisotropy as they found this uh, relation agrees with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with the numerics perfectly. So partially, uh, partly uh, motivated by the theoretical development, uh, uh, the, the Princeton group also did more experiments to have a better quantitative understanding between um, the, uh, 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 the electron anisotropy that is a control using the string and the uh, uh, composite fermion anisotropy. And they found this empirical uh, relation that one is the square root of the other. So I actually didn't realize that. They find that in my model, you can actually get exactly this relation by choosing a very specific range of this Gaussian interaction, which I called S. So the only other length scale in the problem is the magnetic lens, which is this L. So if you choose the range of the uh, uh, Gaussian interaction to be the same as the uh, 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 magnetic lens, you find that these extra factors exactly cancel and you get exactly this uh, the square root relation. <coughs> so, um, well, of course, the, the, the actual interaction is not a Gaussian interaction, but, but the, but the one of our cooling interaction. However, uh, it's very, which of course has no land scale associated with it. However, in reality, the, uh, uh, the, the Gaussian interaction, sorry, the cooling interaction is actually softened by the finite thickness of the quantum web. And that typically is of order the magnetic lens. So having this choice that the, uh, uh, that the uh, uh, range of the interaction to be comparable to the magnetic lens uh, is actually very reasonable. Uh, choice. And again, uh, uh, numerically, uh, you do find that for green interaction, that, that, that actually works out. So I think it's fair to say that um, uh, 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 we, at least uh, through this one half for me C uh, measurement, we have a good understanding uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of these experiments, specific experiments, but, but with this model, uh, I think uh, we, we, we can actually uh, uh, um, very comfortably uh, conclude that it's actually a, a reflection of the uh, geometry of the neighboring 
uh, quantum Hall states. So now what about the, the dynamics? So uh, it has been pointed out uh, um, by actually different people from different perspectives that the, 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 the quantum uh, fluctuation of this uh, geometry of this internal metric, as Hardin would like to call it, gives rise to a, a quadrupolar mode that carries spin two. And uh, by just uh, comparing with the, uh, uh, the spin of gravitons uh, in a, a, a putative uh, 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 quantum uh, theory of gravity, uh, it's actually called a, called a graviton. So, um, so, so therefore you expect that in the excitation spectrum of, uh, uh, let's say the Laughlin uh, 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 liquid, uh, the graviton should be there somewhere in the, um, in the spectrum. So the question is, um, is uh, how do you actually uh, excite these gravitons? Well, the uh, one thing that we can ex immediately conclude is that the usual uh, electromagnetic uh, probe, like a photon, cannot, a single photon at least, cannot excite this graviton. And there are two different ways to, but related ways to actually understand this. One is the mismatch of the quantum number. Graviton has spin two, but photon has only spin one. So you cannot excite a spin two excitation using a spin one uh, particle. Another perspective is that in the long wavelength limit, all the electromagnetic or dipole spectral weight is exhausted by the Sarkozy mode. So it cannot excite any intra level level excitation, which this is. So in some sense, we're, we're stuck. So we need to actually do a graviton version of cyclotron resonance. So, so what, 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 what do you need? Well, the natural idea is not to use electromagnetic wave, but use gravitational wave. Of course, we know that a gravitational wave is everywhere, right? Well, that's not quite the case when I actually made this proposal, which was, uh, which was August of 2015, a month and a half before uh, the first uh, uh, LIGO uh, signal, which I think uh, was, uh, was, uh, was recorded on September 20th, something like that. So, so, so my paper got into a referee trouble at the PIL because referees don't believe there is such a thing called a, a gravitational wave. But of course, to be fair, uh, I was not talking about the LIGO uh, gravitational wave, but actually a uh, condensed analog of it, uh, which is actually a um, uh, acoustic wave. So the idea is that when you probe, uh, when you propagate acoustic waves through the system, there are different ways to do it. It actually induces local strings. And as I already discussed, the strings actually modifies the, the, the effect of mass tensor, which I actually uh, 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 write as a, a metric tensor. So a acoustic wave therefore induces a oscillating metric which of course is exactly what the gravitational wave does. So therefore this, uh, 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 this oscillating metric induced by the acoustic wave should couple to these graviton excitations. Uh, there are different ways to do it. The simplest way is to propagate the acoustic wave perpendicular to the 2D electron gas, which is this, uh, this interface between let's say gallium arsenide and uh, aluminum arsenide. And uh, the way that they couple is through this oscillating uh, 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 this oscillating anisotropy. Uh, I don't want to bore you with the uh, uh, algebra. You find that there is this uh, D wave and more specifically DX squared minus Y squared um, uh, uh, coupling. So therefore it should actually excite uh, D wave excitation or spin two excitations. So, um, so, so this therefore is in some sense a, a, a gravitational version of a, um, of a section the resonance measurements, so for the cyclotron, you have a dipole operator. Here you have a D-wave operator, quadrupolar operator. So the prediction is that the graviton should show up as a sharp, well, not infinitely sharp, but fairly sharp uh, a resonance peak in, this, uh, in, the, in the spectral function of the acoustic wave, just like the cyclotron uh, mode should show up as a resonance peak uh, in your, in your, in your, in your uh, you know, uh, uh, light uh, or electromagnetic wave absorption. So, uh, yeah. It looks here like you expect that to be in the continuum though. Yeah, so, 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 so it, it shouldn't, be, uh, shouldn't be infinitely sharp. So, so in my original paper, I was non-committal. I wasn't sure. And uh, because I, I, I had roughly trouble, I was trying to 
uh, uh, convince referees by recruiting uh, adversary to do the numerical calculations. And for small sizes, they, they do look very, very sharp. Not only is that very sharp, they almost completely exhaust all the, all the quadrupolar spectral weight. Again, very much like the psychotron resonance. So we said, well, yeah, it's, it's sharp, but not good enough for the referees because they don't think there's a gravitational wave. So, yeah. Do we know if that needs to be in the continuum? Could it doesn't have to. Yeah. So, 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 so actually, uh, the perspective I didn't discuss uh, 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 by people like Fred King, Kibbles, and Sandy, they actually were considering the, uh, the pneumatic instability of Russian quantum particles. So that instability in their picture should be uh, induced by the condensation of this quadrupolar mode. So therefore that would happen only when the quadrupolar mode actually splits out of the continuum and then eventually go all the way down to zero energy. But I haven't seen any numerical work on natural or reasonable models that actually this happens. Yeah, but, but, but you're right that if it's in the continuum, it probably shouldn't be infinitely sharp. And it isn't actually, I'm going to show you results very soon. But if they're split off from the, uh, from the continuum, they could be sharp. They, they should be sharp, actually. So yeah, so, so this is, this is uh, our unpublished results uh, all the way back to 15, but the similar results were first, the published results were first uh, uh, obtained by, well, the first, <clears throat> published results were reported by, by Liu and Gromov and Popich in their calculation of the quantum dynamics uh, as a way to probe these, uh, these graviton excitations. But the reason that we didn't rush to publish uh, uh, this is because this special uh, function uh, associated with this, this uh, dx squared minus y squared operator does not reveal a very important property of these gravitons, namely its, uh, uh, its, uh, its chirality. So, um, so to reveal the chirality, which of course comes with uh, two possibilities. In 3D, we know that if you have a L equal to two uh, object, it has M equal to minus two, minus one, zero, one, two. But this is 2D. So the only two possible polarizations are plus two and minus two. So in order to reveal this, um, this chirality, we actually considered a variation of this d operator which is d plus i d and d minus i. So one would actually couple to a plus two excitation, the other would, uh, would actually uh, probe a uh, minus two excitation. So we find that for the model Hamiltonians, uh, where the laughing states are exact, you find that all the spectral weight comes only from the minus two version, while the plus two operator has zero spectral weight. And I'm going to explain very soon why that's the case. So that actually, uh, 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 immediately led to the con uh, conclusion that these gravitons not only exist, they have a definitive chirality, which for the laughing state, which is the electron state, has chirality minus two. So how would you actually prove this, both the energy, the existence, and also the chirality? Well, the idea is that you can actually use a two-photon process to do that, namely Raman. In the Raman process, you absorb a photon, but in the meantime, you also emit a photon. So that's a two photon process. One plus one is two. So therefore a two photon process can actually excite a graviton. So if you use polarized photon for the Raman ex uh, experiment, you should be able to actually review its, priority, as, uh, its chirality. So um, uh, Aaron Pinsack and his collaborators back in the nineties actually used unpolarized photon to do this, uh, the, 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 the Raman scattering for the laughing one third state. And they did find some uh, uh, resonances whose energies actually uh, roughly agree with our numerical calculation. And uh, of course, I mean, we were actually calculating these special functions by making analogy with, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, gravitational wave. But in a very recent paper, uh, uh, Nagui and Song actually showed that if you neglect the very small anisotropy of the valence band of gallium arsenide, that's exactly the spectral function uh, the Raman scattering actually probes uh, uh, um, uh, in, the, in the Raman experiment. So uh, our proposal, therefore, is to re re repeat the Pinzak experiment, uh, but now using polarized light 
then you should not only actually, uh, uh, of course, see the resonance, which they did see, which we now identify as, as gravitons, but also uh, review the chiroid. So now let me actually uh, explain why the chiroid is minus two. So this again uh, can be understood from the dancing pattern. So the lovely dancing pattern basically says that, well, when you have a pair of uh, electrons, well, due to the chiroid uh, 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 um, induced by the, by the magnetic field, they always have relative, positive relative angular momentum. Okay. And the laughing dancing pattern tells you that the minimum uh, relative angular momentum is three. Okay, so this is a three-step rule. Now, because of the Pauli principle or the and I saw, uh, sorry, uh, anti-symmetry of the wave function, uh, even relative angular momentum is actually not allowed. So therefore, if you find a relative angular momentum one state like this, that's actually, that's actually an excitation that is not allowed in the ground state. And that is actually our graviton. So to create a graviton, you need to actually turn a relative angular momentum three dancing, pa uh, dancing pair to a relative angular momentum one dancing pair. So that's a change of minus two, okay? So in this sense, the Laughlin state is a vacuum of the gravitons and the graviton excitation can be viewed uh, as such a pair. Now, on, on the other hand, these dancers are electrons, but let's say if you go to the two third state, then the dancers are the holes, but the holes have opposite chiroid. So everything has to be reversed. And the conclusion is that the graviton chirality should be reversed for particle hole conjugated states. So the two third state should have the opposite chirality as the one third laughing state. So that is a prediction that um, can be tested experimentally, but of course we have no doubt what are the dancing patterns or what are the topological orders for the one third or two third state or any of the, 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 the gene sequence that I showed. But that is not the case for yet another, perhaps the most interesting, um, most interesting quantum uh, state, which is still open at the point at the moment, which is the five half state. So five half state originally uh, was thought to be uh, uh, a realization of the more read state or more read dancing pattern. But now it's understood that there are actually many competing states. So the thing that's special about the one half state is that one half is both half full and half empty. So when you perform a particle transformation, it's still at one half. On the other hand, that will give rise to a different dancing pattern because then you would have the holes doing these uh, uh, the, the more uh, dance, dancing, uh, uh, following the more dancing pattern, but with that reversed uh, um, uh, 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 Chiroidy, and there are all this so-called so particle Fabian five, five state, et cetera, et cetera. So if you actually just use a particle symmetric uh, cooling interaction projected to, well, either the lowest lambda level or more relevant for uh, the five half, the anchor to one lambda level, that should give rise to exactly particle whole symmetric Hamiltonian and particle symmetric ground state in a finite size system. And there you'll find that the spectral function for the plus two and minus two are identical. But in reality, there are always perturbations that break the particle symmetry, one of which is the lambda level mixing, which actually is not a small effect. So if you actually break the particle hole symmetry in favor of the Fafian state by adding a very small positive three body interaction, which actually makes the worried state exact, you immediately find that the plus two spectral weight is strongly suppressed. It's only about 20% that of the uh, uh, minus two uh, uh, spectral weight because the more read state is an electron-like state. On the other hand, experimentally, the more relevant or more likely situation is that the particle symmetry breaking actually favors the anti fabian state, which is a particle conjugated version of the more read state. Well, here, well, as you would have guessed, it strongly favors the plus two spectral weight, while the minus two spectral weight gets strongly suppressed to about, I don't know, 10% of that plus two. So therefore, in this case, you can actually probe 
the topological order and find which one is actually responsible for the five half state by measuring the chirality of the gravitons, which actually are geometric extension. So we actually go all the way back to the origin by actually uh, 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 demonstrating that the geometry in turn tells us about the about the uh, about the uh, the topology of the system. So this is our um, most recent result uh, on this uh, subject. So I guess I'm right on time. So let me actually just uh, uh, close with some uh, 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 and with some closing remarks. So we have heard so much about topology <laughs> in, 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 in in condensed matter uh, uh, talks, either colloquium or seminars. But uh, what, what I've tried to convince you is that there is actually a life beyond topology, uh, even in uh, fractional quantum hot liquids, which is actually a, uh, uh, is actually the the birthplace, if you wish, of uh, topological physics, and uh, geometry actually uh, plays a very crucial role, or actually is a, is a, um, a, a crucial ingredient. Uh, I actually uh, presented a, 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 some specific results, uh, somewhat, uh, well, mostly I would say quite, uh, quite uh, relevant to, to experiments and hopefully will actually motivate uh, more, uh, more experiments. But the bottom line is that uh, they are not only interesting uh, in their own rights, but actually in turn informs us about the topology. And uh, 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 for experimentalists, um, well, I guess the, 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 the discovery of a gravitational wave, of course, is extremely exciting in, in astronomy, which I, I know is a very big component of the physics department here, because uh, in that community, uh, they have pretty much exhausted all the experiment, uh, sorry, the electromagnetic probes of the universe and the, 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 the uh, gravitational wave or gravitational response actually offers yet another window to peek into the universe. Well, in some sense, the same could be said about, about condensed matter because the traditional probes are all electromagnetic. Now, of course, I mean, the actual, gra the real gravitational wave is probably too weak to be useful for us, but maybe it's time to think about some analogs of a uh, of gravitational wave or gravitational response. And uh, uh, well, okay, so, so since we are in the territory of speculation, perhaps uh, uh, a fractional quantum Hall effect offers us a platform to st study some version of uh, a quantum gravity, who knows? Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Um, are there any questions? What is your acoustic wave here? Is this, I mean, for me, is this like a surface acoustic wave or? So, okay, so, 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 yeah. So in one limit, it became the, becomes a surface acoustic wave. So let me actually, so this would be surface acoustic wave. Here, I'm actually just propagating wave in the bulk, but through the, the, the two decks. So, so let me actually explain this plot a little bit more. So here, the acoustic wave has a frequency and a fixed wave vector, but in the perpendicular direction. So the two deck sees the frequency, but the projection of the wave vector of the acoustic wave is actually zero. So therefore, in principle, you can actually tune the frequency and the wave vector independently by controlling the frequency and the incident angle. So the acoustic wave would be the limiting case where the incident angle becomes zero. Yeah. Are you looking for some dependence, some wave vector dependence? Some wave vector and frequency dependence. So, so everything that I talked about, specifically talked about, are all at zero wave vector. So this operator, which actually couples the gravitational wave to the two deck, is a zero wave vector operator because it's Q and minus Q. But this can be easily generalized to find out a wave vector by adding, let's say, half k over two here and k over two. Are we talking like a void of the Fermi wave vector? Uh, there is no notion of Fermi wave vector here. Um, so, 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 uh, so it should be smaller than one over the magnetic length. So the mag okay. So, so <laughs> since we talk, so the magnetic length, if you wish, is the Planck, the the the, the Planck length. <laughs> Uh, for, for our quantum gravity. Yeah, that's the fundamental lens. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. What is the spin two in the acoustic? What is the spin two component in the acoustic? So the spin two, of course, okay. So there are different ways to understand this. From the, of course, we don't have Lorentz invariance here. 
But, but in, in, in analog to physics theory, any, uh, any field that is a, uh, that is a rank two tensor, which the gravitational field is, is a spin two object. So here the spin two nature, the spin two nature is actually visible through this coupling. This is a dx squared minus y squared coupling. So this operator carries momentum, angular momentum two. So it always couples to an excitation with angular momentum to a spin two. So here I'm not distinguishing between angular momentum and, uh, and spin. So I, I didn't get into a uh, detailed discussion. So here we are in a high magnet field for the simplest quantum Hall states, the spin of the electron are already polarized. So they are gone. So, so, so therefore all the angular momentum really comes from the orbital motion. But of course, I mean, this is related to the fact that this is a, this is a rank two tensor. But more specifically, it's more visible here. And of course, the version that we actually used for our calculation are those d plus i or d minus i d version. So it, it couples either plus two or minus two. While this version, well, in some sense is no good for, for, our, for, for this particular purpose because it couples the both plus two and minus two. Other questions? I have a quick question. Um, so let's say the graviton is not in the continuum, uh -huh. sharp excitation. Right. It looks like it's adiabatically connected to the magneto roton. So yes. what allows us then to call it a new excitation? Yeah, so, so different people have different perspectives. So, so uh, some people actually objects to calling them um, a, 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 a graviton. Uh, Song, for example, I guess changes, changes the, 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 the terminology back and forth all the time. Sometimes they call it a, 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 a long wavelength magnetoloton, sometimes call it long wavelength GMP by the, by, by the way the G is growing, <laughs> my, 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 oh, yeah. my, my co cause of the book. Um, now, okay, so, so uh, the terminology is not, 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 not mine, so, so it is primarily uh, Duncan Haldane and Song sometimes use that. Uh, some people prefer to call it uh, a cordial polar mode. For example, I think the very first paper uh, uh, about this is, uh, is actually 1990 by, by Tom Hai Li. You're actually other, much more distinguished uh, 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 postdoc advisor uh, uh, and Xu Chen Zhang. So, so yeah, so, so they really anticipated a lot of the, the, the later developments. Now, I, I think that the, the reason, I mean, I, I, it's, it's very difficult to, hard, hard, uh, to, to second guess what, what, what Haldane has, has in mind. Uh, I certainly don't try to do that, but, but I guess it's not unfair to give it a, uh, not entirely unfair to, to give it a new name because uh, it, it, it was actually not very clear uh, early on whether the magneto roton is a sharp mode only near the minimum or actually all the way to, to long wavelengths, uh, to, to, to the long wavelengths limit. So, so I, I think uh, one of the outcomes of this line of work is to demonstrate beyond doubt that this mode is definitely there. Uh, whether, whether you give it a different name or not is, 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 is a matter of taste, if you wish. Uh, some people did which I followed, and some people choose not to, and I think both are legitimate. Yeah, any other questions? Well, if not, then let's thank our speaker for a very insightful talk. Thank you very much.